Hi, my name's Anita. Y'all bear with me. I'm used to interviewing people, not talking in front of them. So, um, I sheltered for Hurricane Katrina at the Sun Herald Building, which is a um, what's it not going? Okay, which is a um, concrete building, and I've always stayed there for storms. If you leave, it's very difficult to get back in. And as a reporter, you need to be able to um, hit the ground. Um, we had a photographer in the building who insisted on going out before the hurricane passed. And I tried to talk him out of it, but he, he went out. And he came back 10 minutes later. And he looked completely shell-shocked. And he was from out of town, and he told me, your city is gone. And that is the first time I had any inkling of just how bad the storm was. As soon as the wind died enough, we went out and we um, saw what he meant. And along the waterfront, the Mississippi Sound, which spills into the Gulf of Mexico, um, everything was pretty much flattened for at least two blocks back. Sometimes the damage went six to ten blocks inland, depending on the, uh, on the elevations. Um, these numbers are from our newspaper, and this is, these are Mississippi numbers alone. Uh, Louisiana's not in there. I um, lost my home in the storm, and uh, let me tell you when, you, when you see body bags on the sidewalk, that kind of puts it in perspective for you. That it's just stuff. But nonetheless, you're, you're working every day and wondering where you're going to be staying that night. Um, I moved six times in three months and uh, did not wait on FEMA to get a trailer because I had no idea when they might bring it. Uh, the Mississippi Home Corporation had some trailers, and I managed to get a travel trailer and put it on our lot. Uh, a lot of re renters ended up in these um, FEMA trailer parks. Uh, one of our big issues after the storm was insurance. There was a lot of financial insecurity. The major insurance companies, State Farm, Nationwide, Allstate, USAA, the military insurer, decided that uh, they would not cover wind damage that was a part of their policies where water contributed to loss, um, which left us without money and left us with mortgage, mortgages on destroyed homes. So it was very hard to try to plan to rebuild or, or move when you were paying a mortgage on nothing. Um, we managed to get enough money from our insurance company to pay off the, the mortgage on our modest home and, and go ahead and move because it is scary staying near the water in a travel trailer and having a wind of 15 miles per hour or more, you're, the trailer starts rocking. And, and if it gets much higher than that, they want you to evacuate. And that's real difficult to do when you're trying to work every day. Um, so we did move up the street. And a lot of people faced with the financial uncertainties didn't do that. And, and in a way, it was smarter to wait. Um, insurance went up after we moved wind insurance. We had to go into the state wind pool. And our insurance escrow now uh, costs more per month than our mortgage did before the storm. And uh, so that's a real issue for folks on the coast. This is uh, Admiral and Mrs. Lizenby in Pascagoula. We have um, 11 localities in three coast counties, uh, including the counties and the cities in those counties. They lived on the waterfront there on the Mississippi Sound in Pascagoula. This is the home they uh, lost. Admiral Lisby used to oversee ship construction at um, military ship construction at Ingalls Shipbuilding. This is their home after the storm. They were fighting with their insurance company, USAA, over wind damage. You could see they did have a lot of water damage, uh, but they had wind damage as well, and their case is still in court. It has not been resolved to this day. This is uh, where they stayed during the trial. And let me tell you, uh, they were, as Mike said, some, some people who, who lived in Katrina cottages were not poor, and they certainly aren't. 
but they were so happy to have this cottage. Uh, Mrs. Elizabeth had put some antiques in it from her home in Washington, and they had their computer, and uh, you really can move around in these better than travel trailers. Um, so they were quite comfortable there during a very stressful time in their lives. These are the cottages as they were being brought in. Um, and they are on wheels, and that's why the, the jurisdictions tended to treat them like trailers when it came to zoning issues, uh, which, which is unfortunate because they're very well-built little cottages. And you can see uh, one coming into a neighborhood here with a, a travel trailer. You'd be amazed, even though you lose all your things, how fast you can accumulate stuff. Uh, people want to give you clothes and household items, and the bunk beds and the trailers end up being closets, and it gets pretty cramped pretty quickly. Gustav came, and um, there was a mandatory evacuation. A little over 1,400 of the, the cottages are in flood zones. Um, and that is just the nature of the beast when you're dealing with hurricanes and, and disasters. The temporary housing is in places where homes were destroyed and water um, really does destroy a house. Um, this is uh, the point in Biloxi. The Mississippi Sound is to the south. The Back Bay of Biloxi is to the north. During Katrina, those, those bodies of water met in, somewhere in the middle uh, and wiped out the whole peninsula of East Biloxi. But um, cottages came back into the area, and you could see um, the water, this one. And then this is Waveland, Mississippi, where the eye of Katrina hit. Um, and you see that cottage is pretty well going under. But look at that roof, how well it's holding up. Uh, and, and the siding. I, w I, was, I was out in Gustav because it, it, it was a Category 3, but it really wasn't that bad um, on the Mississippi coast. And I was particularly anxious to see how the cottages did. And they were all holding up beautifully. And aluminum roofs do real well in storms. They did well in Katrina. I wish I had one. And that's just an, another shot of Gustav and our photographers from the Sun Herald took these. Now, some people had to leave their cottages. The ones that got water were condemned, and um, they were not able to, to keep them. And they put these, they found these notices on their doors when they got back uh, after evacuating from Gustav. This couple did not want to leave their cottage. Um, they were building a house here on, on a lot. Now, why they put the cottage at the back of the lot by the canal, don't ask me, but that's where it was. Um, they tore the foam insulation under the cottage that got wet. They took it out, uh, and they said that was all that got wet. The rest of the cottage was dry, and they wanted to keep it. It was condemned. So they got a public adjuster to come over. And uh, he's an engineer, Louis O'Leary, and he inspected the cottage and, and found it had stayed dry. And uh, there you can see the water line where these, these bits of um, trash are, grass. So I hope they got to keep their cottage. I think they did. One big thing with the program is building community acceptance. And this was a, a very good um, idea in Ocean Springs, they, they put up a, a demonstration cottage after they were approved. People could go through and tour them. And um, when, when we first moved into the travel trailer, it, it seemed like a mansion after us staying and having, having one bedroom to live in and a friend's um, mobile home. It, it seemed very large um, when we first walked in it, but, but not after a while. At any rate, this, this is more like home and I think the reason that, that people like these cottages, and I'm not surprised by the survey results, is that this, this cottage and the design of it gives people a sense of place. The design architecturally fits in with our community and many of our homes, while maybe a little larger, look a lot like this. So, and this is uh, also Ocean Springs, and this is Cottage Qu Square. It's a D 
demonstration project, they have um, are put 14 cottages in here, and they're using mixed use. Um, they have um, some leased, eight are, are leased, one bedrooms, and then the others are used for businesses, and they're planning on bringing in more. It's been very successful. It's uh, half a mile east of downtown, so it's within walking distance of grocery shopping, and um, we're really trying to focus more on mixed-use development and walkable communities as we rebuild. This is a cottage being placed on a permanent foundation from, from the trailer. And this is the mayor of Ocean Springs, Connie Moran. And this fellow here holding his hand out is Gerald Blessy. He was instrumental in getting these cottages approved for permanent placement in localities across the three coast counties. We have 11 jurisdictions there. And in the end, only one, Long Beach, Mississippi, refused to allow cottages to stay within their borders. Um, and again, there, there's a lot of nimbyism about the cottages, not in my backyard, I, I think probably because of the size. Um, but Governor Barber appointed Blessy to be housing director, and he's looking at a lot of housing options and did a lot to to go talk to the boards about allowing permanent cottages. This is just another cottage being placed on the foundation. And this is Sammy Montefort. Um, I got involved in covering the, the fight to keep the cottages in neighborhoods. This particular one did take place in East Biloxi, which is um, traditionally a community of immigrants. Biloxi is over 300 years old as a city. And it was settled by Slavonians and fishermen. And our latest uh, wave of immigrants have been Vietnamese fishermen. So it's a very old community. And Sammy grew up here. This is his mom's cottage. She was in the hospital when we took this picture. And he was going to the Biloxi Planning Commission and City Council to try to get them permanently placed. They did allow them in East Biloxi. The lot sizes there are very small. And many of the homes, while a little larger than these, were low to moderate income homes before the storm. So they fit well in this community. Uh, Ms. Montefort's neighbor had settled right in. This was before they were even allowed permanently and, and planted himself a lovely garden. And they, uh, people really do feel at home in these cottages. You see they won't work in some areas. This is uh, Front Beach. The lots are larger here, and so are the houses, so they're not going to um, be staying in these areas. This is a Habitat project. Habitat wanted um, was trying to get this concept going of, of using the cottages and expanding on them. It's much cheaper for them than starting from scratch with a stick-built home. Uh, and they, they did the numbers on it, and they could have saved a lot of money like this, but unfortunately... The restrictions in a lot of communities aren't going to allow it. The, the community leaders were scared developers would want to buy up cottages and bring them in and, and create these um, cottage communities. So they, a lot of them said these must be occupied for a permanent placement. The person requesting the permit must have occupied it. They must own the land and so forth. So I'm sure Habitat's still trying to work on that. You could see what they ended up creating, and this is a pilot project in Diamond Head, Mississippi. Um, it looks a lot nicer than a lot of the homes that were standing before the storm. And what's more, this home, home is up to code. And a lot of the homes uh, standing before the storm were not. They were older homes. People have made themselves right at home where they've been allowed to keep these. This lady customized her cottage. We did a home feature on it. This is a, a kitchen. I don't know that it's necessarily hers. And um, you see the, the personal touches that make this just like a home. Um, and I'm going to uh, close this, let, let Mary Rose Leahy close us out here. She's a very uh, direct woman who lives in East Biloxi, and she, as much as anyone, was probably responsible for the cottages being allowed there. And I'm going to let you tell her let her tell you about her Mississippi cottage. Who's going to deny 
this child the right to play in her own yard. Right? Right. That's right. This child's got to play. And how did you end up in a Mississippi cottage? Uh, well, I stayed with my daughter for a while. Then I stayed in a tent for a while. Then I got a trailer. Did you stay in the tent here on the property? Yes, I did. And you were waiting on your trailer? Yes. How long did it take? Three months. Uh Uh-huh. And the reason it took three months, that's right. The reason it took three months was when I filed, I filed in Jackson County, but she said it didn't make any difference because it all went to a central computer. And I was living in that tent, and some people came by. It was right around Thanksgiving, and it was two women from Seattle, I believe. They were firefighters. And they were going around looking for people living in cars and tents and whatever and trying to get their trailers before the cold weather set in. And so they got to work. And the reason I took me so long to get my trailer was they had never put it in the computer for Harrison County. So thank, thank the goodness for those girls that they called and got on the stick. And I got my trailer the day after Thanksgiving. Tell us, you're one of the main people who fought to keep the <coughs> cottages in Biloxi. Tell us uh, about that uh, time and what happened and why it was frustrating, you say. Well, it was very frustrating that the powers that be, the administration, the council, could not see the advantage of us having these cottages. Um, I think it's gotten a little bit better now about being able to get a contractor, but right after, after the storm, I mean, if I'd have had a million dollars to build, could I have even gotten a contractor to build because they were like hen's teeth. Everybody was after them. The fact that this was already built, I'm, I'm a, uh, an older person, and my patient, I don't have much patience. So by having this already built, it took the stress of, off of me of having to deal with a contractor and getting all the things done that would need to get done from a ground up structure. Uh, As I said, especially for older people, I just think it was a godsend. Um, I don't know why these people couldn't see the advantage of it. And yes, I did work real hard. Um, I I call people by name and and had no qualms about challenging them in public at the council meetings or or whatever as to why they did not want us to have these cottages. So I don't know how long it was, but it was a long time, and finally it it was decided that we would be able to. Well, what would you like to tell this this audience that will be seeing the video in, in Washington? What is the thing you'd most like them to know about the cottages? All right, should, should it, you know, well, I mean, I know disasters are occurring all the time, but should another disaster like Katrina occur where people actually need houses, these are wonderful. And I don't think that they cost any more than what the trailers did with the leasing or the model purchasing or whatever, but they certainly are cost effective so that instead of, wheeling up a trailer to some property, they could wheel up these cottages. And then right then and there, the people should be, or soon after, the people should be uh, canvassed to see whether or not they would like to purchase them. Mm -hmm. Then that way, people can get on with their lives rather than a transition from this to that to whatever. So as far as the cottages, I mean, you couldn't ask for better. Yeah, there's a lot of little things that could have been better, but when I'm talking about the major, the things that really make a difference in your life, you could not ask for better. I mean, the refrigerator, the stove, the microwave, the bathroom fixtures, all I had to do was move in and, and start my life again. So that that was really the, the you know, the, the such a relief, such a relief. And now that it's mine, I just can't wait till it's my roof over my head. I mean, you know, us old people, I've, I've not known that not to ever have a home. That This 105-year-old house was my childhood home, and, and I didn't know what it was not to have a home. But when you don't have a roof over your head, trust me, it's hard to live with. Thank you so much for talking with us, Ms. Leahy. Ms. Leahy was going to have um, eight people over for Easter that Sunday in her one-bedroom cottage. 
Um, I have some cost here I did want to give you all. Um, and this is from MEMA. On a 396 square foot, the one bedroom, the, the cost on that was 34500 And on an 840 square foot, three bedroom, 51200 And I don't think they were any more expensive than the trailers. Thank you all.